Good afternoon, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, with me today is Council President Pro Tem Sherry Leitner and Peter Brunel, uh, the Research Director for the Center on Policy Initiatives. We're here today to provide uh, some details on the proposal to raise up San Diego, an effort to strengthen our local workforce and our local economy. Three months ago, I gave the State of the City address and said that San Diego should not be content just to be America's finest city. We had to dare to be a great city. And a great city cannot exist when almost 40% of working age households cannot make ends meet. So we are proposing a measure to change that. First, I am proposing that all San Diego workers have the opportunity to earn five six day, sick days per year. This will help everyone maintain their own health, stay home and seek treatment when they are ill, instead of risking the public's health by coming to work. They can also use that time to care for a sick child or a relative who relies on them. Councilmember Marty Emerald uh, is sorry she could not be with us today to share her strong support, especially for the earned sick leave requirement but she, because she is out of town. Um, but I'm proud to have her support on this measure. Second, I'm proposing a minimum wage of $13.09 for all San Diego workers. I've listened to people who run businesses, both large and small, and from local nonprofits, and they expressed concern about the implementation of an increased wage so they could examine their operations and budgets and have time to make necessary adjustments. Out of respect for those very real concerns, I propose the increase be implemented over three years. The idea that small business folks uh, here understand the need uh, for uh, increased minimum wage is not unusual. A report by the Center on American Progress found that a majority of small businesses in the combined retail and restaurant industries support an increase in the minimum wage. In fact, the report stated that more than 80% of small businesses already pay their employees above the minimum wage. And many large businesses also agree. Recently, Gap raised its minimum wage to $10, explaining, quote, to us, this is not a political issue. Uh, our decision to invest in our frontline employees will directly support our business and is one that we expect to deliver a return many times over. So California's minimum wage is scheduled to increase from $8 to $9 in July and then to $10 in July of 2016. If this measure is approved, San Diego's minimum wage would be $11.09 in July of 2015, $12.09 in July of 2016, and reach $13.09 in July of 2017. Now, we came through this through a fair amount of research, and you will see some helpful context up on the screen. A few comparisons to note. There is a national effort to raise the minimum wage across the country to $15 per hour. The San Diego Workforce Partnership has stated that $17.03 per hour is a necessary self-sufficiency wage. Seattle is moving towards a $15 minimum wage, and the surrounding area has already adopted a $15 minimum wage. Oakland voters are poised to consider a $12.25 minimum wage this November, and San Francisco's minimum wage, which is higher than our current minimum wage a decade ago, is now at $10.74 and may also increase later this fall. This will have a major, this proposal, the San Diego proposal, will have a major positive economic impact for workers and their families and on the San Diego economy. And Peter will provide some more information on that in just a moment. This boost represents a significant change for San Diego for the better. To those who fear what this will do to their business, please remember that these additional wages will be spent by workers on necessities like food and services. It will go right back into the San Diego economy. And it will relieve the fear that so many of our neighbors and your customers experience living month to month just hoping to make ends meet. Now, I welcome additional dialogue and further feedback on these details and the full proposal. And I look forward to the Economic Development and Intergovernmental Relations Committee hearing a week from today. With that, I would like to introduce the chair of the committee and our council president pro tem, Sherry Leitner, for some comments. Sherry? Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today. We need to continue to look for ways to help all San Diegans prosper and bring more hard-earned dollars into our local economy. I'd like to thank Council President Todd Gloria for his leadership on this strong workforce measure that aims to increase take-home pay for working families. 
I'd also like to commend CPI for fighting poverty and pushing policies that benefit our most economically insecure households. Finally, I look forward to hearing public testimony on this strong workforce measure at next, next week's Economic Development and Intergovernmental Relations Committee meeting. It is time certain, 10.30 a.m., Wednesday, April 30th, right here in City Hall on the 12th floor. And with that, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Brunell, Research Director for the Center on Policy Initiatives. Sorry. Thank you, Council Member Leitner. Um, as as uh, was mentioned, I'm the Research Director at the Center on Policy Initiatives, and I'm here today um, to speak a little bit about the, the preliminary estimates of the impacts of this important measure, which, uh, which Council President Todd, excuse me, Todd Gloria just mentioned. Um, we'd like to talk a little bit around what the impacts will really be for, for working families here in San Diego. Um, so what we estimate at this point is that 260,000 uh, employees in the city of San Diego who do not currently have access to earned sick days will, will gain that access, which as Council Member Gloria mentioned, uh, means that they'll be able to take a day off of work when they are sick or when they need to care for a sick family member without risk of losing pay um, or putting their jobs at risk because that's a, that's a very real fear that people have. Um, additionally, roughly 200,000 uh, employees in the, in the San, city of San Diego will get a raise and a, and a significant raise that, that was just mentioned. Um, that raise uh, will average about uh, 200, excuse me, $2,800 annually for each uh, worker that will get such a raise. Um, and additionally, so, so when, we, when we add that all up um, across all those workers, we're estimating that about $580 million uh, additional dollars will be going directly into the pockets of some of San Diego's lowest income working families, which as uh, Council President Todd Gloria also just mentioned um, those are families that have pressing economic needs. Um, they are going to turn around and spend that money right here in San Diego at local businesses uh, to, to get the things that their families really need and right now are living without. So thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and now, I know that all of you have wanted some details since this proposal uh, was uh, first mentioned at the State of the City uh, in January. I've spent the last three months meeting with stakeholders from all across the spectrum, gathering uh, input uh, to form today's proposal, and I'm confident that this is a strong foundation for further discussions. Starting today and with the first hearing next Wednesday, I ask for San Diegans to weigh in and to give your suggested changes so that we can move forward with a measure that truly does raise up San Diego. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Well, first question, um, how do you prevent the um, inflationary aspect of doing something like this? So certainly that's what a lot of people are going to ask. Uh, if, you, if you're raising, uh, you know, the salaries and uh, pay to uh, a certain level of people, the business is going to take a look at what their fine line is as far as being profitable, and the odds are they're going to raise costs at the same time. So is there a means of sort of holding one in check while the other comes up and really does provide an advantage, or is this just an inflationary cycle? I think the question, uh, just to repeat for those who may not be able to hear, won't, won't this be passed on to uh, consumers and cause prices to increase? By um, uh, extending the implementation period over three years, uh, we believe that prices uh, can uh, increases, large ones, can be largely avoided. Um, there may be slight increases. We've seen that in other communities. But on the whole, what we've seen is a large positive net economic Im impact in other places where this has been studied. Are you worried about businesses moving maybe to La Mesa or anything like that for a lower minimum wage? Well, I mean, I, the cost of relocating would have to be off, have to outweigh, I mean, be less than the additional cost uh, of the wages. And one of the things that I've learned through this process and listening, particularly to small businesses, is that what happens is by paying a lower wage, you get a kind of turnover, and that actually has a cost to the businesses, the cost to recruit. To, to train and to retain people um, becomes uh, actually fairly significant. I think that's where, where GAP was coming from when they said that they felt by raising their own minimum wage uh, that they'd actually see
see an economic benefit. Um, so I think that for the businesses that look at this, uh, they'll see uh, that it doesn't uh, that that would not make uh, financial sense. And think additionally, I go back to that point. I was really struck by talking, particularly to nonprofits and to small business who who already pay essentially a living wage. Either that's mission consistent with what they do as a nonprofit, or as a small business owner, you understand that you rely on your employees more than perhaps a big business does, and as a result, you can't afford to have the turnover. And so they've already made that decision. Uh, so it, it, what we're simply trying to do is to encourage more of those 200,000 people who are living below that currently to get them up to where some others already are. And, and then on a, on a state level, California's mm -hmm. often criticized. It's got higher tax rates than most other places, and people criticize the cost of doing business here. Um, the business community will probably say that this just adds on to it. What's your take on that? Well, uh, you know, I, I don't. I, I don't necessarily know that I always agree with that, but I, I know that that is out there. You know, this council, uh, as I think, have been sensitive to that by passing a number of regulatory relief measures to try and address the cost of business in this community. Whether that's uh, fee deferrals and map extensions, uh, uh, sidewalk cafe ordinances, there's a ton of things that we've tried to do, and the door is still open for that. In fact, in many of the discussions I've had with the business community, it has been a less of a, the focus of the conversation uh, doesn't always stay on wages uh, and compensation, but really. Moving moves to uh, a jobs-friendly environment and a desire to see reforms in our development services department or other economic incentive packages that you now are starting to see come out of City Hall. Uh, we're providing those, uh, I think, in the next few days to Illumina, uh, which is uh, one of our great local companies. Uh, we're doing that for some of our craft brew industry. And again, uh, that is unrelated necessarily to this matter, me measure, these regulatory relief efforts, uh, but those will c continue. Uh, and again, if people have ideas and suggestions on what more the city can do, we'll be happy to try and tackle that. There was some talk of tying regulatory relief in directly into this measure. Why was that abandoned? Or well, I'm still waiting for requests or suggestions on specifics. That's still a possibility. Oh, absolutely. Well, we would do that regardless. I mean, again, as ideas have come forward for what people want, the Sidewalk Cafe Ordinance is a really great example. It was a business in my district that raised this. Lori Zaff championed it. We got it done. Um, I'm still waiting to hear from uh, you know some of the organizations that have said this is a concern to tell me what they might need, and, and those will go forward uh, regardless of the outcome of this measure. What about the proposal to include something into this that business licenses are 20 percent less in exchange for this increase in minimum wage, something along those lines where it's actually part of the same measure? Well, our business license is actually quite small. I mean, it, it's well. I, I mean, I think that was one of the cha the challenge. Of the question was, what you know, could we reduce our business license, which is thirty four dollars currently, and a, a twenty percent reduction in that? Uh, it is not. I mean, I, I I would argue that we we gave it the office already when when you kept that low relative to other jurisdictions. But again, doors open for other ideas. You know, when we were charging ten thousand or twenty thousand, whatever it was, for a sidewalk cafe permit. Uh, that was ridiculous. We got rid of that, and now I think it's like 150 bucks or something along those lines. Uh, so again, when, when given tangible examples, unfortunately, when I talk to some of these uh, groups, uh, often the concerns are, 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 are beyond our pay grade. You know, there are issues that are really at Sacramento or in Washington. Um, and, but you know, we have lobbyists again here at the city, and we're happy to try and advocate on that level as well. I'm always uh, surprised when you hear the argument that something is broadly beneficial for the economy, then why aren't businesses making this argument? So what do you say to that? If, if this is so darn good for the economy on a broad level, then why, why isn't this broadly advocated by business? Why is it resisted by many quarters? Well, uh, I would disagree with the s belief that it's not broadly uh, uh, accepted. Again, 80 percent of small businesses already pay better than the, the minimum wage. Additionally, we have uh, uh, you know number of economies, 600 economists, uh, a number of uh, big businesses, corporations like Gap, in and out others who've already said, you know, this makes financial sense for us. Let us do this. I think our concern is for those who don't have those similar out view, uh, point of view. And as a result, you know, that ends up displacing the economy in other places like subsidized housing and other things. But no, the point is, is that the folks who are in business, if it's that simple, why wouldn't they have done this long ago? I, again, if, if 80 percent of small businesses are already providing this, I think most have. It's the remainders that aren't that, again, the, the, the offset really does fall onto the taxpayer in the forms of public subsidies like welfare and public subsidized housing. When the Census Bureau changed how it, gathered, how it measured poverty to reflect the cost of housing, California is far and away the worst. San Diego County is close to the worst of any large county. So the main reason for that is the cost of housing. Has the county done, or the city, done anything specifically to bring down the cost of housing beyond the process attempts to build very limited numbers of affordable units. 
I think we've done a lot of things, and we'll do more. I mean, naturally, we've had a very robust discussion on subsidized housing uh, recently, and, and just you know, those efforts were not successful. Although I believe we'll see something come back again in the near future. With regard to the actual permitting process, which again is where a lot of these regulatory relief questions come from, when you see the added emphasis on community plan updates in the mayor's proposal, which I believe the council will strongly support, or the expansion or the desired expansion of programs like Civic San Diego into additional neighborhoods, what we are talking about is trying to invite. Um, additional development and that through though that development you hopefully will bring down the cost of housing but Chris I have to tell you it's not just housing I hear from my constituents that water is getting more expensive the energy is getting more expensive the groceries are getting more expensive and yet they're not seeing consummate increase uh, relative uh, related increases in their wages and so this is a part of the concern it's not just about housing although I recognize that's a significant part of it you acknowledge that your climate initiative is likely to drive up the cost of housing well, I think the climate initiative is a, is a work in progress, and much like this proposal, uh, we're open to suggestions on that. I think what I've heard from folks is a real focus on a very narrow band of that overall plan. The discussion has been on point of sale and what you do to retrofit existing homes, which, frankly, we heard these same complaints when we talked about trying to do water-wise uh, features uh, when we dealt with the 1990 drought, and now that's commonplace, and frankly, we're glad that we did it because we're in a favorable position relative to today's drought. Set that aside, the climate plan's focus is largely on public transit and on the adoption of uh, renewable energy sources. That's where the vast majority of the emissions reductions come from, and what, we're t what folks have chose to argue about is that. But again, that is a subject to negotiation exactly like this proposal is. How did you come up with the number 13 old now? Well, you know, I'm a pretty centrist guy, right? And uh, what you see, uh, and I think if we can go back to that slide, you know, as we looked at the data and tried to, to talk to everyone, you have uh, the self-sufficiency uh, rate that was offered by the San Diego Workforce Partnership in their annual report, saying 1703. Uh, you know, you have the current state proposal that gets us to, ten, uh, to $10 roughly three years from now. And basically, it's a middle of the two. It matches well with some of the research that CP CPI has done. It also matches well with the city's existing living wage policy that applies to city contractors. Um, but that dollar amount, the phase-in, and other aspects of this plan um, are open for uh, amending, and I imagine as this goes through the council process, that will likely occur. What's been your take if you've looked at like Seattle or San Francisco and other cities like Santa Fe, New Mexico that have their own minimum wage? I mm -hmm. mean, have you seen businesses shut down and leave, or have you seen um, more economic health? I mean, what's what's been your... On what other well, I don't know, Peter, if you, you might have more details on that. I mean, I, I, I think it's, well, I've seen a lot of positive comments. I've heard some negative ones. I think it's a mix. But, Peter, do you have some? I think yeah, have I'd, be, I'd be happy to talk about, um, I mean, I think, I think one of the most illustrative examples is San Francisco, just because that's also within the state of California. And unlike San Jose, there's sort of, uh, you know, it's been in place longer, so we have sort of more data to look at. And what we've seen there. Um, there's been some analysis that look, has looked uh, specifically at the restaurant industry because that's an industry that relies heavily on low-wage labor. Um, and when comparing restaurant employment, for example, uh, in San Francisco to Alameda County, um, you can see the trends uh, and there's really no, no disadvantage that was experienced in San Francisco County relative to Alameda County right across the bay. Similarly, there was some analysis that looked at um, the propensities of businesses to fail or to, you know, to, to um, go out of business, um, comparing both San Francisco and Alameda County and comparing businesses that were either phased in more slowly or totally exempt under the San Francisco law and didn't find any higher rate of business failure among um, those businesses that either because they were in Alameda County or because of their size were exempt uh, in San Francisco. There's also been like a lot of talk about the demographics of who works for minimum wage. I, like a lot of things I see is like 20 percent or this and then a lot of them are just college kids or like the third income earner that's in their 20s. I mean, what are the demographics of somebody working minimum wage? Um, I don't have them all available off the top of my head. Um, I can tell you that we have some of that. I, I'd be happy to get you some of that information. Um, I mean, we definitely, it's, it's changed significantly in terms of people's conception of uh, who it is and, and we see um, a, a significant portion, uh, I, I don't want to hazard a number off the top of my head, but a significant portion of those earning, you know, it, it's, it's very hard to get data on who's earning exactly minimum wage, but say below $9 an hour. Um, a very significant portion of that is over 30, for example. Um, if I could. If I could on that front, you know, the, a part of this is the fact that the service uh, industry jobs are the ones we're seeing lots of growth in. And I, I, I certainly remember what it was to go to McDonald's when I was a kid, and I go there now. I think all of you know I, I go to fast food restaurants a lot. And the, these are not 
th th these establishments are not filled uh, with a bunch of after school high school kids. Uh, increasingly, what you see behind that counter are adults, and these are adults that are raising families that have children and that's a part of the predicament and I've heard the argument about well you need to work up and out you know and and I, I, I understand and I hear that um, and we want to have those pathways out but the fact of the matter is if that's where we're seeing the growth in job creation then we have to address this and uh, again out of respect for taxpayers who end up having to pay uh, for these low wages in other in other ways uh, I think it is incumbent upon policymakers to put forward ideas that can try and address this Others? You, uh, you said that uh, some of these decisions that would help the economy are above your pay grade, plainly pointing to Sacramento and Washington. Well, in California, one in six adults who wants to find full-time work can't find full-time work. That didn't used to be the case. What do you say to the people who run Sacramento? What are they doing wrong, and what should they do to create middle-class jobs? Well, a couple things. I mean, I, if you're talking about recent history, I mean, we're coming out of the worst economy that we've seen uh, in 70 years, but we're already starting to feel the benefits of the... My, my, I'm getting there. You know, when you look at the mayor's budget proposal that shows, you know, substantial increases in property tax, sales tax, and tourism tax, you know, the argument is the economy is coming back, and that, you know, the hope is that uh, that uh, uh, the jobs come along with that. Um, with regard to what more can Sacramento do, per se, uh, you know, when when redevelopment was ended, um, you know, to have other economic development tools provided to local communities to continue the work of affordable housing creation, economic development, and job creation, uh, you know, we're still sort of waiting uh, for a replacement for that. I recognize financially they're not so inclined to do that, but I think there's probably low or no cost ways that they could give cities the ability uh, to uh, generate more economic stimulus and activity. Um, and you know, there's a host of other things I'm sure they could do. That's why my plea and my request for regulatory relief ideas is extremely genuine and sincere, because I know there's always stuff that we can do. And as I say, these stakeholder meetings I've had over the last three months, typically the concerns have been about you know, a, a permit fee for a toilet. I mean, this one, re one restaurateur said, I'm more concerned about that than when I'm paying my employee, because that just doesn't seem justifiable. But I get the point about paying my, my workers better. These are the kinds of ideas that come forward. You know, We have to kind of look at that under Prop 26, messing with our, our, our water and sewer uh, uh, fees can be difficult, but uh, these are the kinds of things that we should engage on. And my suspicion is that just that kind of openness to suggestion could go a long way if our legislators are listening. Anyone else? Guys, thank you so much. Oh, yes, ma'am. One of the employees that you spoke of, Mr. Gloria, that would be affected by this proposal are, as you say, restaurant employees. Would that include people who are working in the That is not contemplated in this proposal, largely because, as you know, it's a state um, regulation that, that does not permit the, the tipped employee component to be considered. Um, and, and what I would say is that what we're trying to do is strive for universality with this proposal. And so there have been requests from folks from all parts of the spectrum to be exempted out um, because they may have the one-off or two-off examples of, you know, a bartender or, or a waitress that does incredibly well. Um, but at the same time, we're addressing the landscapers, the fast food workers, uh, the, the maids, people who don't, uh, who may in some cases actually receive tips, but not to the level that you're describing about, you know, uh, perhaps a, a bartender in the gas on a Saturday night. I mean, that's we're, we're trying to strive for as many people as possible to lift them up and out of poverty. And you know, the, everything is subject to dis further discussion. But m what you're raising, it's my understanding from the research we've done, is largely prohibited by the state and therefore would not be a part of this proposal. When would this go to the council? Well, this is going to the council's economic development committee next Wednesday. Uh, you know, obviously everything's subject to council votes. Uh, you know, on uh, its kind of current timeline uh, you know you could see this potentially get to council sometime in June or July um, and uh, so that's essentially it but you know if if uh, for any reason uh, that one never knows <laughs> simple majority no we, we, we have well, I'm, I'm proposing an initiative oh. yeah okay that be done by the end of July Well, I, I would assume. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we'll have a broad discussion about uh, 
quality of life in this community and what it takes to live in San Diego. Uh, and you know, I imagine it'll be a, a fairly robust discussion. But again, my hope is that the discussions that we've had to date and the ongoing dialogue we'll have over the next number of months, that we will craft a proposal that is reasonable, broadly support it, and one that uh, hopefully uh, will be uh, supported by the vast majority of San Diegans. Steve, what I've seen from this experience is that in all of my discussions, every one of them, everyone acknowledges the minimum wage needs to increase. That they see for themselves the fact that families who are working are struggling to make ends meet in this town and not able to afford food and shelter and some of the basics. They get that. The question and the problem, of course, are in the details. And what I'm doing today is putting uh, you know, my marker on the table and to allow folks to respond to it and then to provide their feedback. I'm open to making changes in order to gain additional support. Uh, we have a number of, of aspects, obviously the dollar amount, the phase-in, the indexing, the number of earned sick days. Uh, there are a lot of components to this proposal, and the feedback from individuals, particularly those who are directly affected, uh, will be greatly uh, they're, they're, will be heard uh, and will craft, uh, will, will amend as necessary, and then ultimately put forward something I think that the vast majority of San Diegans will not only support but embrace and be glad that we did. All right, guys, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I appreciate it.